If you want to see the most understanding and most forgiving people in the face of the earth, what you need to do is look for true believers. You agree with that? Yeah. If you're not agreeing with me, there's a problem. <laughs> if you want to see the most forgiving, most understanding people, they got to be Christians. <laughs> you're in trouble if you're not even convinced with that. If you're not convinced that you can forgive, if you're not convinced, well, how can we convince the world, right? That's a big problem in Christianity. There's a lot of Christians probably who are not forgivers. They're not willing to forgive. They're not understanding the people. Well, in fact, honestly speaking, if you probably somebody from the world, from, from watch, people watching the video, would very, be, would be very, very quick to, to ask me, Pastor, aren't Christians known for being very, very unforgiving and very judgmental people? I'll answer that quickly, right? Okay, if this is to clarify it right away so that issue is finished and done away with. Number one, and not, I don't want to say number one. The principle I have is this. Because a lot of people say that Christians are very hypocritical, unforgiving. That's what I'm going to say. If a person is either, okay, we're, we're here for like, pastor is always like, it's not either or, it's both and, right? Now here I'm going to say this. It's either... A person is unforgiving, judgmental, and hypocritical, or a person is a Christian, but cannot be both. Okay, I'll clarify that. But I mean, that's the general statement, right? That's the general statement. But you're looking at me like you're not agreeing with anything I'm saying right now. So I'm going to go further on this one. Let me just clarify that. Okay, what do you mean by that? Pastor, possibility number one, if there's a person who's a an unbeliever, a not believer, a un who is a very unforgiving spirit, very judgmental, very hypocritical. These are possibilities. First possibility, the person is a fake. Person is a fake. The person is just claiming to be a Christian, presenting himself as a Christian, but he knows very well that he is not a Christian. He's just faking it. All right? Probably he's trying to court a lady who's a Christian, so he's just faking Christianity. Right? Or wanting to be quoted by a Christian guy, he's cute, he's handsome, he's good looking, so I want to be a Christian, quote unquote. Right? But secondly, the person is not a fake, the person is deceived. What do you mean by that? Deceived as in, he believes he is a Christian or she. I mean, by the way, those of you like uh, very particular with he or she, okay, I'm going to use the old term, he, as representing everybody, alright? Okay. So, Every time I say he, take it as he, she. It's just, I hope we can come up, by the way, I hope we can come up with an English word that represents he slash she. Yeah. Right? So we don't have to worry about interpret papers and, or, or pieces and all of those things. But anyway, okay. Second possibility, the person is deceived, meaning to say, he believes he's a Christian because of what people told him or but because of the doctrines he was taught, but in reality he is not. There's a reason why he's acting like that. He's acting like a, a hypocritical person, unforgiving, very uh, judgmental person, okay? Third possibility is the person is a new believer. There's, there's still a lot of rough edges in that person. Probably one of them is being judgmental. Probably one of them is still living in his own ways and all of that because he's new. The person hasn't really grown yet as a believer. There's still a lot of old ways in him, but he has changed drastically in some areas, but there's still a lot of things that he has not changed, right? Now, number four is that the person may truly be a Christian, but the person is flawed big time, okay? And you mean that? The person has been a Christian for quite a while, but he has a weakness in these areas. Okay, now that could be contentious. It could be something that people are going to say, how can you say he's a Christian pastor? And we're not going to debate on that one. At least one theory but that some Christians would 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 propose is that there are quote unquote they say carnal meaning to say they're more living in the flesh they trust Jesus as their savior they surrender their lives to Jesus but they're struggling big time on that one okay now I'm gonna tell you right away though okay so question is there a Christian who is in a bad relationship with others the answer to that is there ought not be so if you're in a bad relationship with other people right now <coughs> Don't take communion <laughs> until you decide later you're going to have communion until you decide to fix that. Alright? Because today I'm going to encourage you. I'm going to encourage you. 
Based on the title that we have this morning, this is what it says. New Year 2019, title is First Things First. This is part three, letter A, okay? And it's about fixing relationships with others before giving or offering your gifts to God. Okay, I'll say it again. Fixing relationships with others before offering gifts to God. So as a review, we're going to take care of the first few points. The first point we talked about was the priority of seeking God over all. Over all people, over all things. Second one was priority of correcting ourselves before correcting others. So today is priority of fixing our relationships with others before offering our gifts to God. Are you ready for this? Yes. Okay, now, we have already established the fact, okay, that this is not equivalent to it. Pastor, I thought you said God first. Now, how come here is others first before God, okay? So, we have already explained to you that God requires us to make Him the number one priority of our lives number one on a list so far above everybody else that the second on your list is so far from him that if you look at the comparison it will be considered as hatred i was speaking with somebody last when i preached about it the first time around and talked about how god is like and then the others are saying that the person who told me like pastor how come god makes it so hard you know so, but I've explained that to you. When Jesus said, one of the most continuous, some one of the most questioned verses in the Bible is when Jesus actually said that. Okay, anyone who does not hate, right? His relatives, okay, close relatives, immediate relatives, those people who really, really loves, because of me cannot be my disciple. It's not worthy of me. Okay, so that's one of the most like questionable, quote unquote, for some people verses in the Bible. Well, we've explained that very clearly. There's something I'll tell you honestly about. There are people who, despite a very clear explanation regarding those things, will really not believe you or not will not even listen to you. It's close right away. Boom. I don't like that verse. I'm not going to listen. But I praise God, though, because there are people who really seek God. There are people who really seek God. There are people who are actually, the moment they hear that verse, because their heart is so much for God, and they see the worth of God, how great God is, they really see the value and worth of our Lord, and their hearts are fully and truly surrendered to Him. That when they hear that verse, they're very happy. Like, ah, oh, that's exactly my heart. That's what my heart expresses, and that's what expresses my heart. So when they hear that verse, they're like, yay! Okay, I'm proven right. Praise God, right? Is that you? Yay! Okay, there you go. We got one, we got one real Christian here. <laughs> Is that you? Yeah. yeah. That, don't you have any? Do you have a problem with that verse? Nope. Okay. So we've explained that. I'm not going to go there. Yeah. I'm not going to going to go there again. Okay. So, but the reason I said that is that being established, we've already established that God ought to be number one. So that being established, what we now see okay, is a verse that proves to you that God actually cares about our relationship with others. So, I thought you wanted me to hate them, but that's the reason we're going to talk about today. All right? And this is what he said. We're going to start it with Matthew 5, 23 and 24. And uh, I'm going to read the NIV first. And then we're going to go to the usual New Living Translation. All right? So NIV states, Therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you. What does it say? Leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift, okay? So now in the New Living Translation, this is what it says, verses 23 to 24. It says, so if you are presenting a sacrifice, that's a nice PowerPoint. <laughs> Super post, all right, there you go. Okay, so 23 to 24, so if you're presenting a sacrifice at the altar, now the version is in the NIV's gift, right? If you're presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple, and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you, leave your sacrifice there at the altar, go and be reconciled to that person, then come and offer your sacrifice to God. Okay, now, someone will probably be very quick, good to quit. Like, I told you, Pastor, I told you, Pastor, God values family, more than the church. Right? That's the reason why I don't go to church on Sundays. Because, Pastor, you know, I work six days a week and the only day I have available with my family is Sunday. And I want to spend that time with my family. I'm sure God understands. Can you see the verse? 
Right? Well, what do you say, Pastor? Well, I, let me tell you honestly, the premise is right. The premise is right. The premise that it's family first before church is biblical. But the application is wrong. What do you mean by that? Okay? Now, this is something, by the way, that even I as a pastor know very well. When you talk about it's got to be church, it's got to be family first before church, because even this, 1 Timothy 3 5, let me read it to you. Because this is something I take to my heart very seriously. It says this, especially for pastors. If a man cannot, ma cannot manage his own household, how can he take care of God's church? I live by that principle. Let me tell you honestly, there have been very many times when I have contemplated of actually resigning from the church. When there were times when I'm able like when we talk to our kids and I present to I presented them what's the best option about things. That's what we do, we talk at home. I presented them the best options, the best thing we could do, and then they don't agree with it, and they live the way they want to live, and they basically like, I don't care about what you said, Pastor, like for us this is right. And then I'm not able to convince them. Sometimes I contemplate about should I even manage the church if I cannot manage my children and they don't want to obey me or respect me, something like that, right? So there are times like this, that's why I'm so serious about being able to like, take care of your family first. That's something that is very, very close to my heart. However, okay, this is something I'm going to say. Okay? It's family first before church. You got it there? It's family church, uh, I'm sorry, it's family first. I don't have the PowerPoint. It's fed. Oh my goodness. It's supposed to be one after the other. Oh, sorry. <laughs> like, boom. Okay, I was going to go, it's family church, it's family first before church. And then, but, then the next line, it's God first before family. <laughs> right? If God's first before family, when God says in Hebrews 10 24 and 25, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works, and let us not neglect our meeting together. Hello? God says in His Word, and let us not neglect or forsake meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of His return is drawing near. That is God's Word, that is God's heart, that is God's will for you to come to church. If you don't go to church, it's not the church, it's God you're disobeying. What do you do? If Sunday is my only availability, I'm going to spend, honestly speaking, right? You're going to prepare yourself anyway to go out with your family, right? One hour of church, that's it. One hour of church. The most we do is what? One and a half hours? We barely do that now. So start with the church first and then go attend to your family. Then you go put God first. Right? On the first day of the week, go put God first and then see what God is going to do. Okay, so if you look, if you look at the verse, by the way, the comparison is not between um, our fixing our relationship with others and fixing our relationship with God. You look at that verse again, it's very clear. It's not, the comparison is not between those two. What is the comparison about? It's fixing our relationship with others and offering our gifts to God. It's not our relationship with God, it's offering our gifts to God. That's the reason why that's the subtitle we have. Right? Fixing our relationship with others first before offering our gifts again. I didn't say fixing our relationship with God. Are you getting it? Yes. Okay, okay, so man, that's the reason why if you look at the context of that scripture, this is what it says, okay? Matthew 5, 21 and 22. You have heard that our ancestors, our ancestors were told, you must not murder. If you commit murder, you are subject to judgment. But I say, if you are even angry with someone, you are subject to judgment. Are you angry with someone? I'm not going to say what's what you're subjected to, the Bible just said it, okay? But I say if you're even angry with someone, you're subject to judgment. If you call someone an idiot, I, again, that's a Bible, I'm just reading it, right? I'm not calling you that, okay? So if you call someone an idiot, you are in danger of being brought before the court. And if you curse someone, you're in danger of the fires of hell. All right, now that's serious. Isn't that true? But I'm a Christian pastor. I, I, I'm not going to contend with that. I'm reading the Word of God. Okay? So God is basically saying, you don't even have to commit murder. Murder. Is murder serious? Of course it is, right? Who wants to be murdered? You don't want to be murdered, right? Who wants to murder? 
All of you probably would, right? It's a serious offense before that, but what God is saying is you don't have to really commit literally physical murder of someone to be serious. In God's eyes, if you just have a derogatory remark about somebody else, that's very critical. That's how God values your relationship with others. Are you following me? Do you see that? That's how much God values our relationship with each other. It's very, very precious to Him. So again, Matthew 5, 23 and 24, if you look at that verse, here are some important truths that we're going to see here. Knowing, okay, that before you do it, before you leave your gift to the altar, before serving God, or before offering anything to God, fix your relationship first. And for me, honestly speaking, being a pastor of this church, this is one of the greatest blessing verses I have. You know why? It doesn't matter if me and my wife are, in, are embroiled in a very intense, passionate, heated argument or fight before coming to church. I'm going to preach. And guess what? I cannot be hypocritical about my preaching. One way or the other, before I even serve anything, before I even pray, before I preach, one way or the other, it doesn't matter how intense our fights are, we've got to make amends. Alright? We've got to fix that because I don't want to be hypocritically standing here teaching everybody, you are got to obey God and exactly disobeying Him in that area. Uh, because it's going to be hypocritical. I don't want to be disciplined, I don't want to be judged, I don't want to be condemned by God in that area. Understand? Okay, so I, I know better. I don't want to fall upon the hands of the living God. You understand what I'm talking about? He's merciful, but I still don't want to fall upon the hands of our Almighty God. Rather do you, right? Okay, I mean, anyway, you too, right? Okay, now, so, that's the reason why I cannot hold a long list. I mean, I preach every Sunday, almost every Sunday, that means you say I cannot have an anger or grudge against anybody longer than seven days. And by the way, by the way, I have, once in a while I teach a Monday Bible study. I have a Bible study on Monday, I have a Bible study on Tuesday, I have a Bible study on Wednesday that I teach. What does that tell you? I cannot hold on to a grudge longer than 24 hours. Pastor, what about Thursday to Saturday? You don't teach anything. That's true. <laughs> right. Okay, but, but by the way, hold on. But, we make it a point as much as possible. We fail a lot of times, but we make it a point as much as possible to pray with the entire family every night. And I cannot be holding a grudge at anybody in my family because I want to be an example to the kids. I don't want them to see me being hypocritical and go, man, Pastor, you know, you're know, you holding something against us and you're praying, how, how can that be an example? So what it's telling you is from Monday, from Sunday to Saturday, I, I cannot hold a long list of grudge. I have to do it every single day. It cannot last more than 24 hours, okay? And that is something that the Bible actually says that is very true. Ephesians 4.26, I'm living the Bible here because it says in the Bible, and don't sin, everybody say don't sin. No. Okay, how? By letting anger control you. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. Amen. Amen? That's a biblical principle there. Not just for a pastor. Not just for a pastor's family. It's for everyone. Okay? So that's why I'm going to say this. A good way. That's a biblical principle, by the way. A good way to avoid sin. Because I'm speaking anger. I'm speaking anger can easily bring you to sin. The Bible is very explicit about that. Okay? So now, here's a good principle we learn from that. A good way to avoid anger, avoid sin because of anger, is by letting go of our anger before sunset. Not 12 o'clock midnight. Sunset. So a lot of times people are saying, like, Pastor, it's like, ooh, as long as I do it before midnight, it's sunset. Okay, so the very good principle before sunset. But by the way, you don't have to wait for sunset. This is not telling you to wait for sunset. I mean, if you can forgive right away, if you feel like forgiving already, I mean, the faster you can forgive, go ahead and forgive. Or the, the faster you can ask for forgiveness, ask for forgiveness. You don't have to like, well, the Bible, the Bible says until sunset. I have a leeway until sunset. Right? Because that's not what it means. Are you understanding? Of course, right? It's understandable. But some of us are crazy. Okay? <laughs> We try to like twist the Bible just like to make us feel better and like work it the most comfortable we can, right? We, we, we are. Okay, but listen carefully. God or Jesus, our Lord just doesn't, He just wants you to live in freedom. 
And he wants you to live in freedom every day. Because once you are actually, once you mend the relationship, the burden's gone. The burden's gone. It flies away. The, pad, the, the burden's gone. The weight is gone. Okay, the stress is gone. He wants you to live in freedom. Praise God. Hallelujah. I'm free. Once you're able to fix your relationship with other people. And that takes precedent. Okay? So, but what else do you see from this scripture? And these are some of the things I'm going to share quickly. As you know, the organ's already playing. I got to hurry this. <laughs> from that verse, these are some scriptures you would see. Okay? Number one, it is possible for believers. Okay, let me see. Have I skipped something here? Okay. It is possible... Oh, here we go. It is possible to forget an offense without it being resolved. Did you understand the verse? If you are taking an offering at the altar and then you remember, that means to say it's very possible for us to forget. How do we forget it? You have an offense against somebody or somebody has an offense against you. How do we forget that? Okay? It's probably because we have gotten so used to it. It's not a good feeling. You may be carrying a boulder over your shoulders, but because you've gotten so used to it, you almost forget that it's there. It doesn't mean that your life is light. You're so heavily burdened. We're so heavily burdened when we don't have a good relationship with people, but we've taken a good, there's a fear full of bitterness, and it's so heavy, but you've gotten used to that as a normal, that we forgot about it. That's one of the things you got to, that's the reason why he said a lot of prisoners of war have spent like who spent their lives in prison for years and years sleeping on a, on a concrete like really rugged rugged like floor. The moment they get home to their families, instead of sleeping on the bed, they find themselves sleeping in the floor. They've gotten comfortable with the uncomfortable. For Christians, God is saying, I don't want you to feel comfortable with the uncomfortable. It's a very heavy burden that you're carrying once you have that bitterness inside of us. The grudge, okay? Another thing that I saw, okay? It is possible for believers Can you say amen to that? Amen. Right. That's what? That's the Bible. Okay? Paul was speaking to the Christian church. It is possible for believers to have misunderstandings and quarrels or fights. Why do I say that? Because the church is composed of very different people, with very different backgrounds, with very different pasts, with very different personalities, with very different tastes, with very different preferences, with very different differences. So you can't expect that there will be conflicts. You can expect that there will be differences in style. You can't, you, you can't expect that there will be misunderstandings between us. You understand that? It's, it's putting on liberty. And if we try, as a church, the reason why you get a lot of pressure, okay, we live in such a pressure as a church a lot of times. So a lot of churches, I praise God, FCF, I, I, don't, I, hope, I hope we're not. But a lot of churches are living under such heavy, undue, unneeded pressure because somehow everybody's expecting each other to live a perfect life. I mean, we're expecting that, but somehow we believe that the person ought to be living a perfect life. Now, it's unfair to expect our brothers and sisters in Christ to be perfect. We want them to live perfect, but we've got to be realistic about it. Nobody's going to be perfect. And it's unfair for people to expect us to be perfect. Because the reality is even the Bible tells us. Okay, by the way, let me show you something. I want to show you something that's very true. Positionally, we're perfect. Practically, we're not. You understand that? Positionally, we're perfect because positionally we are, Jesus is in us. Positionally, we're taking the position of Christ. And Christ is perfect. Before God, we're perfect. You understand that? But practically, in our day to day grind, there's a lot of imperfections in us. I've won. I, I'll be very honest with you. I have a lot of imperfections and flaws. Okay? I have a lot of imperfections and I have a lot of flaws. I make a lot of mistakes. And by the way, you too. Does it hurt? Okay. By the way, you too. We all make a lot of mistakes. And yes, mistakes. <laughs> Mistake with S. Make a lot of mistakes. First John 1 8 says that. Actually affirms that if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Anyone can claim to be sinless. 
but it doesn't make the claim true. Right? They probably just believe they are sinless. Okay, here's another thing that we see here. You may forget, okay, you may forget that you actually have some grudges against somebody. Number two, it's possible for the church, brothers and sisters in Christ, to quarrel and fight. Number three, okay, when we sin against each other, are you ready for this, church? If we live this out, if churches only live this out, if Christian churches only live this out, no church will close. Okay, can we read it all together? Okay, can you read it together with me? You guys are so really troubling, really quiet today. Is it cold? Okay. Next Sunday, if it's this cold, I'm going to get the heater up so you could be like one dot. Right. Everybody read it together. When we sit against each other, we're told to reconcile. We're not told to leave the church. All right, is that something that is very now because this is it. Sub, sub point that I have there is this: God's solution for broken relationships is to fix it, not to leave it yes. broken. Yes. That's true, even with your families, Amen. your in-laws, whether it's your sister-in-law, whether it's your proverbial mother-in-law, or your father-in-law or oh, you're not in laws your actual father your actual mother your actual wife your actual sister or brother your actual husband never leave but fix it and same is true with the church okay now i got i got so much more to talk to you about but the organ is always playing for about more than five minutes <laughs> so this is something i'd like to close with okay this is it uh, in talk about fixing relationship, there's one relationship that is vitally important, prime importance before God. There are two relationships you have to take care of, okay? And the first one is the first, the first relationship is the most important relationship we could ever have, that's our relationship with God. Amen. If you haven't yet reconciled, been reconciled to God, if we haven't yet placed our full dependence on Him for our salvation, and you haven't surrendered, like I surrender, you haven't really surrendered everything you are, or we are, everything we have to God, then it's time today for you to be reconciled back to Him. And we could be reconciled to Him because of the bridge that God sent for us by God, man, Jesus Christ. Because of what He's done on the cross, we can now be brought back to God through the forgiveness of our sins in Jesus Christ. And the second thing is, as I said, you cannot live comfortably. If you have something that's not right with somebody else, you cannot live comfortably and serve God. He goes first. First, we're going to talk about this next week. Leave your gifts down the altar. Before you offer anything, before you serve me, fix your relationship. Well, I don't want to have two people pass on everyone.